by the leaders of the United Kingdom and Australia to announce the AUKUS agreement, a generational opportunity that will enhance U.S. national security interests by transforming our alliances, deterring aggression from the People's Republic of China, and fostering a more peaceful and stable Indo-Pacific. Beijing today has the world's largest navy. Xi Jinping's hyper-nationalist government has been laying claim to territory and international waters. They have built artificial islands for new operating bases with runways for military aircraft and ballistic missiles. At the same time, they are aggressively trying to influence Australian politics and civil society, buying critical infrastructure like port facilities in Darwin, making political donations, even hacking Australian parliament and major political parties. This is a critical moment in which the United States needs to show that we are serious about our commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific. Congress has a vital role to play in cementing this long-term vision, and time is of the essence. Unfortunately, the necessary congressional codification of some of this agreement has not gone as smoothly as some of us would have hoped. Senator Risch and I worked incredibly hard to codify the two central pillars of AUKUS. And I want to acknowledge also Senator Kane's um, engagement on that initiative as well. Pillar 1 includes selling U.S. Virginia-class nucleus-powered submarines to Australia, making them the only other country other than the United Kingdom that we share this technology with. Training Australians to crew and to produce such submarines and significant financial contributions from Australia to expand our own submarine production capabilities. We authored legislation with all of these elements that we moved to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee with strong bipartisan support. I want to thank Senator Risch for his partnership in helping us to advance Pillar 1. However, it did not make it into the Senate's version of the National Defense Authorization Act. In addition to the French submarine industry, some of our colleagues in the Senate expressed concerns about the primary purpose of AUKUS, the submarine transfers and support. But if we fail to move forward with full congressional support of AUKUS, including the nuclear-powered submarines, we are doing Beijing's job for them. China is, ag is against AUKUS because it complicates their calculations across the Indo-Pacific. With nuclear power, these submarines can travel long distances underwater and undetected. This will give Australia the ability to protect security interests from thousands of miles away. And we will be able to crew submarines together that operate directly out of naval bases in Australia, further enhancing our already deep bilateral relationship and enhancing our reach into the region. Congress needs to play its part of the agreement is going to work. We need to send the message that the United States can be relied upon. Australia and all our partners in the region are watching. President Xi is watching. And thousands of Americans employed in our shipyards who would build these submarines and who would benefit from the Australian contributions to support and expand our submarine infrastructure are watching as well. So I hope our witnesses will help us understand why both pillars of AUKUS will improve the national security interests of the United States, Australia, and the United Kingdom. Because based on mission requirements set by the Navy, the United States and Australia need these submarines faster than they are currently being produced. Dr. Carlin, I think it would be helpful if you could clarify exactly how the Department of Defense plans to increase American sub production. How will you go from making 1.4 subs a year to three subs a year? Secretary Moy, I hope you can shed some light on uh, Ken Barra's uh, perspective. What will this deal mean for our alliance with Australia and what is the cost of inaction? And finally, Secretary Lewis, how will you ensure that as we co-develop advanced military technologies with Australia, our proprietary products will be safe from Chinese espionage? Will this require changes to all parties' export controls to protect U.S. military technology, as well as the military technology we develop together through this new partnership? I'm supportive of Pillar 2 of the agreement, the co-development of advanced military technology, which will require streamlining and strengthening export controls among the partners. But I don't want AUKUS to be used by some as a Trojan horse to undermine U.S. export controls for the sake of commercial, industrial interests that are unrelated to the partnership. AUKUS should be about modernizing our historic alliances with two of our closest partners 
who have fought alongside the United States in defense of democracy and freedom. With that, let me turn to the ranking member for his opening statement. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, certainly, uh, I, I want to associate myself with the remarks you've made. Uh, both of us recognize uh, how important uh, AUKUS is, and uh, we're anxious to see it move forward. And uh, certainly, uh, there have been some disappointments so far, but uh, that uh, doesn't mean we can't uh, do better in the future. And I think uh, that's the purpose of this, is, is of this hearing, is try to get this thing on track and, and move it uh, more quickly and uh, more efficiently. As the United States uh, enters into a period of strategic rivalry with China that includes military competition on a scale we haven't seen in, gen in generations, China has undertaken a nuclear breakout and fields the, lar the world's largest navy and a fully modernized air force. To meet this challenge, we must move quickly to expand the reliance, uh, resilience and capacity of our defense industrial base. U.S. allies should be full partners in this effort, and the AUKUS partnership is an important first step. The defense trade partnership between Australia, the UK, and the US is meant to bolster collaboration on joint advanced military capabilities. In particular, our goals include increased technology uh, sharing, uh, co-production and co-development, and expedited export licensing processes. Pillar 1 focuses on Australia's acquisition of conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines. While this is bold and essential, it is also highly contingent upon supply and unlikely to produce increased sub, uh, submarine capability in the Indo-Pacific for a decade. Importantly, many of the capabilities needed to fully impl implement Pillar 1, including cruise missiles, the boat's combat system, or advanced uh, computing capabilities will heavily be dependent on Pillar 2. If, uh, if executed as intended, Pillar 2 offers the potential to produce meaningful results this decade. Pillar 2 can also expand and build, build resilience across the supply chains and industrial bases, an imperative given uh, the lingering impact of COVID and U.S. limitations exposed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. However, our export control system remains over, uh, overly cumbersome and treats our closest allies with proven track records of technology protection as if they were our new or emerging partners. Simply put, Australia and the United Kingdom have legal, regulatory, and technology, technology control regimes that are comparable to those of the United States. Demands from the administration that Australia and UK undertake extensive reform of their domestic, political, and regulatory system are frankly condescending, and it highlights the need for a clear shift in the sta in state's attitude toward defense cooperation with its allies. I fully appreciate that uh, we don't want to open the door, as the chairman said, to uh, using this as a Trojan horse to do some things we don't want to do. I've served on this committee for the uh, 15 years now that I've been in the Senate. I also, at the same time, have served on the Intelligence Committee. And I would like to report to this committee that one of the very first things I noticed uh, between the two committees is that uh, there is a very distinct difference between the way we treat allies in the intelligence field versus how we treat them on other things like export. Um, and I think uh, probably it would behoove state and the Department of Defense uh, to spend a little bit of time with the intelligence community. We share incredibly, incredibly sensitive and important material with the five eyes. Uh, and so here, I, I don't have the concerns that some have. Uh, as, as far as the chairman's concern on using this as a Trojan horse, that is a legitimate concern, and it certainly deserves uh, uh, attention. But having said that, um, I, I think that uh, th there may be an overreach there, and I think that uh, we, uh, we, we really ought to uh, take a deep breath and sit down and uh, review how we can reconcile how we treat our allies in the uh, intelligence field uh, and make it more compatible with how we treat them uh, in trade and industrial uh, uh, matters. The Department of State, in concert with the Department of Defense and Commerce and other relevant U.S. agencies, should clearly communicate to our AUKUS partners our requirements to ensure robust technology, security, and export control measures, and then adhere to them. In addition, these agencies should work to reduce barriers uh, to defense innovation, cooperation, trade production, and sustainment with the governments and industry partners of the United Kingdom and Australia. If AUKUS realizes its potential, it will set a precedent 
and incentivize similar agreements with other close U.S. allies. We need to get this right before we add other partners, but these agreements are necessary if we are, able, if we are to prevail in the long-term competition with China, Russia, uh, and their partners. If AUKUS fails to achieve its lofty goals, it would not only show us to be an unreliable ally, it would also signal that we are fundamentally unserious about com competing with China. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Risch. Let's turn to our witnesses. It's my privilege to welcome back to the Committee Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Political Military Affairs, Jessica Lewis. Prior to assuming her role as Assistant Secretary, she served here on the committee as a Democratic Staff Director for five years. Those were the most glorious years of her career. Uh, from 2007 to 2014, Assistant Secretary Lewis was the National Security Advisor and Foreign Policy Advisor and then Senior National Security Advisor to Senate Majority and Minority Leader Harry Reid. We also welcome Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy, Plans, and Capabilities, Dr. Marla Collin, uh, who is currently performing the duties of the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. Dr. Collin is now working for her sixth Secretary of Defense, where she has advised the Department on Policy, Spanning Strategic Planning, Defense Policy, Budgeting, Future Conflicts, and Regional Security Affairs. She has previously performed the duties of Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy from August of 2021 to February of 2022, and prior to that, served as Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. Lastly, we're pleased to welcome uh, Ken Moy, who has been serving as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs since June 15th of 2021. Uh, Mr. Moy has been in the Foreign Service for 29 years, and his diplomatic stops have included tours in Taipei, Beijing, and Seoul. Prior to his, uh, this role, Mr. Moy was the Acting Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research. So welcome to you all. I want to thank the witnesses uh, for their participation in today's hearing, for their service to our country. Uh, your full statements will be included in the record without objection. I'd ask you to summarize them in about five minutes or so so the committee can have a conversation with you. And with that, we'll start off with you, Assistant Secretary Lewis. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for the kind introduction, uh, Ranking Member Risch, and honorable members of the committee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. As noted, I am joined with my, by my colleagues, Dr. Carlin, P. Das Moy, and I'm excited to talk to you about the role of the State Department in AUKUS, one of this administration's hallmark national security and foreign policy initiatives. I want to start um, first by thanking both the chairman and the ranking member and the entire committee for your leadership role in making AUKUS possible. Through your support for the legislation passed by this committee in the State Authorization Act, and much of which was then included in the National Defense Authorization Act passed by the full Senate in July. Um, I want to start by giving an overview of AUKUS and then discuss legislation and the interim plan that we're also putting in place. One month ago, I was with Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin as they met with their Australian counterparts in Brisbane. During our time in Australia, our leaders emphasized that AUKUS, as both the chairman and the ranking member noted, is poised to be a transformational initiative perhaps our most consequential Indo-Pacific defense and security partnership in a generation. By modernizing longstanding partnerships, AUKUS will strengthen our defense, enhance deterrence, and contribute to peace, security, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. AUKUS comprises two pillars. In pillar one, we are working to provide Australia with a nuclear-powered, conventionally armed submarine capability as soon as possible. In pillar two, we are partnering with Australia and the UK to jointly develop advanced military capabilities based on the most cutting-edge emerging technologies our nation possesses. In the past year, we have made significant progress on both pillars. In March 2023, the United States, Australia, and the United Kingdom announced the optimal pathway to provide Australia with a conventionally armed, nuclear-powered submarine capability at the earliest possible date. Modernizing Australia's submarine fleet will be a long-term, multi-decade undertaking, and the AUKUS partners are moving ahead to implement this phased approach. 
On pillar two, as, a recent, joint, as recent joint experiments on swarming UAS, on hypersonic technologies have demonstrated, we are leveraging the collective power of our industrial bases to create a trilateral ecosystem that combines the competitive and comparative advantages of each nation to strengthen our joint capabilities. Let me turn to legislation. As was noted by both the chairman and the ranking member, for AUKUS to succeed, we need to enable speedy, seamless, and secure technology and information sharing between our countries. Earlier this year, the administration submitted an AUKUS Pillar 2 legislative proposal to Congress. And as I said earlier, we are extremely grateful to this committee for ensuring with broad bipartisan support that the substance of our proposal was included in the National Defense Authorization Bill. We look forward to working with Congress and hope that the final version reflects the legislation needed across all four of the administration's submitted proposals so we can deliver on the promise of AUKUS. To put it simply, under the Senate's language, most defense items will be able to move forward without needing a license. And approved entities within the three countries will be able to move defense items or retransfer them without needing new authorizations. This groundbreaking approach will ensure that AUKUS Pillar 2 can deliver its full potential, while also ensuring that our three nations maintain shared standards to safeguard the crown jewels of our defense technologies. In the interim, while the legislation is being worked on here, the Department of State is also implementing a novel use of existing authorities to expedite and optimize technology sharing and defense trade among our AUKUS partners. The State Department's AUKUS trade authorization me mechanism, known as ATAM, is an interim solution to streamline defense trade until legislation is enacted. We've begun engaging with the committee on our interim mechanism and will continue to consult closely with Congress as we finalize our approach. We are also working with our Australian and British counterparts to ensure equal opportunity and access for American firms and workers within AUKUS efforts in alignment with our respective domestic regulations and international trade obligations. We all have a stake in the success of AUKUS and we look forward to seeing this through together. Australia and the United Kingdom are two of our closest allies and we are proud to stand shoulder to shoulder as we strengthen our longstanding alliance and implement this historic partnership. And I look ahead and I look forward to working with this committee and Congress to promote agile and secure defense trade and cooperation between and among the AUKUS partners. Thank you. Secretary Moy. Chairman Menendez, uh, Ranking Member Risch, uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify you, uh, to testify before you today. Almost two years ago, President Biden, alongside the leaders from Australia and the United Kingdom, announced the creation of an enhanced trilateral security partnership, or AUKUS. AUKUS, as Assistant Secretary Lewis noted, is a modernization of our longstanding partnerships with Australia and the UK to address the security challenges of the future and support peace, prosperity, and stability in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. AUKUS deepens our diplomatic security and defense cooperation in line with President Biden's vision of working with allies and partners to solve global challenges. AUKUS enhances the United States security, that of our allies and partners, and contributes to global peace and security. Since its announcement, much work has been done to realize this commitment. On March 13th, as uh, the Assistant Secretary noted, President Biden, Australian Prime Minister Albanese, and UK Prime Minister Sunak announced the optimal pathway for Australia to acquire conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines. AUKUS partners are pursuing a multi-phased approach over the coming decades with the goal to deliver the submarine capability to Australia at the earliest possible date. Under Pillar 2 of the partnership, we continue to scope a variety of advanced capabilities and ensure that our defense export systems are prepared to meet this challenge. These commitments have critical implications for our foreign policy and national security. AUKUS is a critical element of our efforts to advance implementation of the U.S. national security, defense, and Indo-Pacific strategies with the goal of advancing a free and open, connected, secure, resilient, and prosperous Indo-Pacific. AUKUS supports our shared vision of a world that is stable and prosperous, where countries thrive, trade, and collaborate to address shared challenges, and where all countries are empowered to make their own sovereign decisions free from coercion. 
A free and open Indo-Pacific region is vital to global security and prosperity, which is why we must deepen cooperation now. Like our other partners across the Atlantic and Indo-Pacific, AUKUS partners understand the critical role the region plays in global trade and global prosperity. Economic growth and prosperity require stability and predictability, conditions that AUKUS seeks to undergird through enhanced deterrence and security. Our alliances and partnerships have played a foundational role in contributing to peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific for the last 70 years. AUKUS is a concrete commitment to strengthening these partnerships by integrating our partners in Europe and Asia, recognizing that our world is increasingly interconnected and that the security of all the world's regions and our security here at home in the United States are all inextricably linked. It reflects the critical role that both our European and Indo-Pacific partners will play in supporting our shared vision for enhancing peace and security in the Indo-Pacific and around the world. AUKUS will bolster the security of the United States both through the development of cutting edge defense and security capabilities, but also by ensuring our allies are best positioned to contribute to their own security and our shared interests as they continue to modernize their military capabilities. AUKUS is more than submarines and defense projects. It is a generational commitment to working with two of our closest allies to strengthen security cooperation to meet the many multifaceted challenges of the future. It is an unparalleled opportunity to boost the defense capabilities, industrial bases, and economies of all three nations while increasing investment and economic prosperity here at home. It will bring together our sailors, our scientists, and our industries to showcase the best of American ingenuity and technology along with that of our allies. With the optimal pathway now set, the hard work of implement implementation begins. The size, scope, and complexity of actualizing partnerships or this partnership cannot be understated or assumed. And the work must advance now to deliver a capability to meet the moment as the international security environment continues to rapidly change. For AUKUS to succeed, it will take the full support of the US government, Congress, and the American worker working alongside the same constituencies in both Australia and the UK. The continued bipartisan support of Congress is absolutely critical. Passing relevant US AUKUS legislation is not only needed to enable progress, but also to send critical message, a critical message that will be received around the world. The United States industry, to, the US, to, to US industry to provide assurance, to plan and succeed, to our closest allies, Australia and the UK, to demonstrate that we stand together as we advance uh, a plan to bolster joint security. To our other allies and partners around the world, demonstrating that the United States delivers on its commitments, and to our adversaries and competitors to demonstrate the seriousness of our intent and resolve to maintain continued international peace and prosperity. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Dr. Carlin? Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today on the AUKUS Partnership which is an unprecedented and generational opportunity to deepen our security partnerships with two of our closest allies. I want to start by acknowledging the service of three of our Marines who lost their lives in a military training exercise north of Darwin, Australia on August 27th. I want to express my heartfelt condolences to the families of the three service personnel who lost their lives there. I'd like to thank the committee for its broad bipartisan support of AUKUS. It is vital to ensure AUKUS delivers on the promise of this opportunity. As we approach the two-year anniversary of our three nations leaders announcing this historic partnership, it is clear that we have made tremendous part progress in advancing the objectives of AUKUS, but we still have far to go to realize the full potential of what AUKUS can achieve. Today, I hope to reinforce three main topics how AUKUS fits into and advances the 2022 National Defense Strategy, how we are seizing the generational opportunity AUKUS presents, and why we need to expand defense cooperation with our closest allies. First, how does AUKUS fit into our National Defense Strategy? The 2022 National Defense Strategy describes the People's Republic of China as our most consequential strategic competitor for the coming decades, highlights Indo-Pacific security and stability, and underscores the importance of new and fast-evolving technologies to meet the shifting global security environment. AUKUS is a critical part of how we will achieve the goals of the National Defense Strategy. It also describes integrated deterrence as a holistic response to the strategies that our competitors are pursuing and calls on the Department of Defense to build enduring advantages across the defense ecosystem. 
AUKUS will help us realize the concepts laid out in both the national security and national defense strategy. Second, how are we seizing on the generational opportunity of AUKUS? Through Pillar 1 of AUKUS, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia have committed to conduct naval nuclear propulsion cooperation in a manner that is fully consistent with our respective legal obligations and that sets the highest nonproliferation standard. We are moving out swiftly. Since the announcement of the optimal pathway in March of this year, three Australian officers have graduated from U.S. Nuclear Power School and the USS North Carolina conducted the first port visit under our commitment to increase rotations of nuclear powered attack submarines to Australia. Through the AUKUS Advanced Capabilities Line of Effort, also referred to as Pillar 2, we are enhancing cooperation in other critical military capabilities. For example, in April, under the auspices of the Artificial Intelligence Working Group, we trilaterally demonstrated the joint deployment of artificial intelligence-enabled assets in a collaborative swarm to detect and track military targets in real time. Through collaborative investment in high-end capabilities, we are ensuring our ability to maintain a free and open Indo-Pacific with two countries who have stood shoulder to shoulder with the United States for more than 70 years. Third, we need to expand defense cooperation with our AUKUS partners even more. The U.S. network of alliances and partnerships is a strategic advantage that competitors cannot match. We have been fortunate to have great partners in the Departments of State and Commerce who are working with us to ensure we are creating an enabling environment that securely streamlines and promotes deeper cooperation. We appreciate the continued support of Congress to enable us to accomplish these critical objectives. As you're aware, there are four areas in which the administration requires congressional action to facilitate implementation of this generational opportunity. First, the optimal pathway requires ship transfer legislation to authorize the U.S. to sell Virginia-class submarines to Australia as an interim capability before SSN AUKUS comes online. Second, legislation is required to allow us to accept his, Australia's historic investment into the U.S. submarine industrial base through financial contributions. Third, to move out on training, Australia's submarine workforce requires legislation, excuse me, to move out on training Australia's submarine workforce, legislation is required to allow the U.S. government to coordinate submarine workforce training with Australian private sector entities. And finally, we request legislation to enable export licensing exemptions, supporting defense trade that would facilitate the goals of AUKUS and raise our collective standards to protect the, the critical technologies that provide U.S. forces with war fighting advantages. We cannot implement AUKUS without your critical support in all of these areas. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to meet with you today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you all for your testimony. Before we start a round of five minutes, I want to ask unanimous consent to include in the record an article uh, that is entitled, Meet the Tiny State Department Officers Clearing Billions of Dollars Worth of Weapons for Ukraine. They've handled a 150-fold increase in work by doing in hours what used to take months. Without objection, so included. That happens to be Secretary Lewis's department. Um, so we'll start a series of five-minute rounds. Uh, so let me ask you, uh, Dr. Carlin, um, how are we going to uh, increase our, our sub-production? We do one point, about 1.3. We need to get it to at least three. One of the issues here that was raised during the whole uh, NDAA is the concern about giving uh, our subs at a time that we're not producing sufficiently at a rate to replace them. So how do we how do we meet that uh, that concern? Senator, as you know, we have two really important advantages, our undersea capability and our historic network of alliances and partnerships. I want to hone in on the first to make sure I get at your question. There's two pieces here. There's maintenance and production. And so we need to make sure that we're investing in both of those so that we can have more operationally available submarines, particularly out in the Indo-Pacific, given the, the focus that we're talking about today. With Congress's leadership and support, the administration has been able to put in billions of dollars, indeed approximately $4 billion in the latest president's budget, for both production and maintenance of submarines. And so there's a lot of really hard work to help increase those numbers. If I could just hone in on maintenance for one moment, the Navy in particular has been doing some really good work to increase the availability of submarines. And indeed, since May, that availability has 
gone up from 60% to 67%. The goal is to get to 80%, which they think that they're on track to do in about 2027 or so. That would allow there to be seven more operationally available submarines in our arsenal. This is all really important for- So you're suggesting that a significant increase in maintenance opens up more subs to be put at sea? Indeed. Okay. Uh, what happens if we don't approve Pillar 1? I just want to make sure I understand your question, sir. As in, uh, appro uh, approve the request to sell. Well, if we if we if we do not make Pillar One as a transfer uh, of submarines to the Australians as part of a very broad deal, what happens uh, if we don't do that? Uh, we think it's a priority to keep investing in the submarine industrial base, and we'll continue to do so. That is a, a separate issue. Uh, look, uh, uh, Australia has demonstrated a commitment uh, to purchasing these uh, conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines. They've shown that they will treat this responsibly. I would note that there's a bit of a crawl, walk, run approach to how they can do this. So getting uh, submariners who are trained in how to do so, getting workforce trained, it all kind of builds on pieces so that AUKUS can deliver its full potential to deliver deterrence at every phase. Yeah, but if we were not to do that, there would be consequences for us in the Indo, not only with the Australians, but in the Indo-Pacific, the message that we would send is uh, one of unreliability, and two, uh, our reach would be significantly limited. So I hope that those who, who have a concern about this will find their way uh, to uh, be supportive. Uh, now, I, I am supportive, as, as is evidenced by the fact that we passed legislation out of the committee in a bipartisan way of both Pillar 1 and 2. So having said that, however, I do have some questions. Uh, Secretary Lewis, I understand that the UK and Australia's export control regimes operate differently and are not reliably comparable to that of the United States as of this moment. And that this means there is a greater risk that US military technology that is exported pursuant to Pillar 2 activities could be compromised by US adversaries, including the People's Republic of China. Can you confirm for me uh, that the Australian and British governments that if the Australian and British governments were to make certain adjustments to their export control regimes, enforcement and safeguards, that their regimes could be deemed comparable to the United States system? Senator, thank you for the question. Um, let me start by saying, um, yes, we are confident um, that Australia and the UK um, and the United States will end up um, with comparable standards. And I think what you're pointing to is the reason we need those standards is to make sure that adversaries or um, others who are trying to gain control, access to our IP, to our most sensitive technologies cannot do so. Um, so we are very confident um, that Australia and UK will be able to move forward, that we will end up with comparable standards. Um, and we are also committed to making sure um, that we are protecting our warfighter and our technology. And has either country committed to bringing their export controls up to U.S. standards, at least for protecting U.S. defense goods, technologies, and services, as this committee passed in the MATES Act? My understanding is um, they are, each country is looking at changes they may decide to make. I don't want to speak for them, um, but again, I am confident that they will be able to do so. And one last question. Uh, we, uh, if we lower our comparability standards for Australia and the UK significantly, uh, which of course, as, as Senator Rich has pointed out, they're very, very long-term reliable allies, I get that. What do we do uh, when other partners tell us that they inevitably will, uh, want the same lower standards? And they will be not uh, insignificant allies as well uh, in terms of their long-term relationship with us. Shouldn't they, we use this opportunity to leverage enhanced allied export controls so that we are protecting our own vital taxpayer-funded military technology? Sir, I think you're absolutely right. What we you want can to stop the answer there. Thank you. Uh, no, no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Got to have okay. a little fun here around. Sometimes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, but I think the bottom line is, as we work very hard to increase and um, the, make the system work, so that we can create these kinds of alliances and partnerships where we're providing our most sensitive, highly um, lethal 
defense articles to other countries, we want everybody to have the best possible standards. Let me give you an example. This isn't specific to Australia or the UK, but let me give you an example of the kinds of things that we could be concerned about. Um, for example, we've recently seen some uh, Chinese pilots getting training um, from other countries, um, including uh, pilots uh, here in the U.S. We need to be able to prosecute those. We want our partners and allies to be able to do the same. We want to make sure um, that if a country is trying to acquire a particular technology, it can't get around the system by going into a place where there's more room in their export controls. Um, and I think that to me, this is these. It's common sense to work together to bring all of us to similar standards. And I would say it's not just to protect our companies and the IP that they produce, but fundamentally it's to protect our warfighter. Um, because if these technologies are exploited and used against our warfighter, we're also putting them in danger. And we take that responsibility very seriously. Thank you. Senator Rich. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, let me say, I'm incredibly proud that this committee uh, has done its job uh, as far as producing legislation and uh, coming to agreement on it. And uh, I want to thank the chairman for uh, working uh, in a partnership. As always, the, the devil's in the details. And uh, I hope no one gets the idea that uh, we may have uh, uh, some uh, different views on uh, uh, how we handle this technology transfer, that somehow there's daylight between us. There really isn't. Uh, this is a, we're all on the same page here. Uh, and uh, so I uh, hope we can uh, move uh, forward in that regard. Uh, the pilot, uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, you, you mentioned the pilot training of Chinese citizens. Uh, you know, we got the same problem, though. We, even with our standards, we got the exact same problem. So uh, I, I don't, that's not a good example. There's other examples, but that's not a good one. The other thing I find ironic is that, uh, uh, and, and first of all, let me back up. You, you're aware that the that the uh, uh, other parties to the AUKUS agreement are groaning a bit at the United States insisting that, we, that they make certain changes in their uh, standards. Are, you're, you're aware of that, are you not? Um, Senator May, um, I start by just saying, I first of all want to go back to what you started with, which is that this committee's work really put us on a path to achieving all of our goals on AUKUS. And, um, as someone who worked on the committee, I know how much work goes into that, both by you and your staffs, and just to thank you again for that. Um, I actually will say I was just in Australia with both our Secretary of State, our Secretary of Defense, and their equivalents, and across the board, we heard broad support for what we are doing together. Um, I have to tell you, I spend a lot of time meeting with other countries, and it was possibly one of the most positive meetings um, I've ever participated in. I think the Australians, um, and again, uh, they of course can speak for themselves, but I think they're very committed to Pillar 2 in particular on how we can look at the comparable advantages that may, they may have, for example, in production as uh, of certain items as they work with our defense industrial base. So really the conversation that I participated in was about how do we take advantage, how do we bring our um, companies and our research institutions together to work on Pillar 2. Well, I, I, first of all, let me say that my experience in talking with them both the Australians uh, and the Brits uh, is the same as yours. Uh, they're, uh, they're, it's incredibly positive. Uh, certainly, uh, you don't always agree on everything, but uh, everyone's uh, rolling up their sleeves and committed to get this done and to, to reach the middle ground we need to, uh, to get there. It's a little ironic uh, that we are beating a drum about uh, a higher uh, or different regulatory changes uh, when, in fact, uh, we're the ones that have actually been the victim of, uh, of Chinese uh, thefts and uh, uh, espionage and what have you, whereas I'm not aware of any of publicly reported instances of the same thing happening to the Australians uh, uh, or, or the Brits. Um, um, is that an accurate statement? Uh, um, let me share what I'm aware of. I actually think um, because we have our laws in place, we're actually able to prosecute the uh, Chinese, the, 
the, those who were training the Chinese pilots. And um, while I was in Australia, I did learn that an Australian pilot uh, also participated. Um, and we're uh, looking to extradite that pilot here under our laws um, to deal with that issue. Um, but again, these kinds of issues, that's really an illustrative example, um, but certainly not the only one. I'm concerned also about what we uh, what we talk about are the known unknowns, the other ways that we may see those kinds of challenges coming forward. And, and I agree with that. And, I, and none of this is existential to uh, uh, the uh, failure of, the, uh, of this program. I mean, these are things that we can work through. They're, uh, they're, they're things that we can and should work through. On ATEM itself, um, I, I would really hope uh, that uh, you don't view ATEM as being a solution to the problem. It's temporary. And, uh, and it, there's got to be more to it than that. So number one, we need to get it finalized. Fair enough. Sir, um, I agree with you. The, um, the purpose of ATEM is to be an interim measure so that we have something in place while the legislative process uh, is being uh, completed. And so um, absolutely uh, agree that we will um, continue to work on ATEM. I think that um, for those of you who aren't um, living in the world of uh, State Department acronyms. Um, this is uh, our interim measure um, that we're working on while we're waiting uh, for the AUKUS legislation to pass. And I think the good news is a lot of the work that we're doing um, to put this interim measure together will also be helpful, um, hopefully, um, when the final legislation is passed. Uh, I, I appreciate that. And again, I would urge that, uh, that finalization be given a very high priority and get there as quickly as you can. And also have everyone understand that this is only interim because it's going to take more uh, than this. And uh, with that, uh, my time's up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Rich. Before I turn to Senator Carter, let me just say, uh, we share intelligence with government officials. Uh, export controls, uh, however, uh, control U.S. defense technology to non-government persons. Uh, so our bill requires comparability of export controls only on U.S. origin defense items, not on all of their own indigenous products. Um, and it's, I think, important to note that Australia's DNI counterpart publicly warned about the extent of Chinese espionage directed at Australia. So I, I think we all agree on what we want to achieve, and the concerns are legitimate on both sides. Senator Card. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I want to add my thanks to you and the ranking member for the manner in which our committee has been engaged. Uh, I strongly support this alliance uh, and recognize that Congress needs to act. I want to thank our witnesses. But Dr. Carlin, I want to start with the realities of our budget, so I have an understanding whether you talk about increasing our capacity on maintenance to get more subs out there and perhaps increasing production. Senator Wicker has asked for additional submarines to be produced. Uh, you also mentioned the fact that Australia will be contributing to these costs. Uh, we have tough budgets. Give me an idea as to whether the implementation of Tier 1, uh, tier one uh, will require additional resources from the United States. Thank you for highlighting this issue. Uh, we have for years, thanks to the great support of Congress, been investing in our submarine industrial base uh, and will want to continue doing so given that undersea capabilities are such an unparalleled advantage for us. Uh, as it relates to AUKUS, um, to the extent legislation passes that would permit this, Australia has offered an unprecedented and historic uh, investment into it to, to, uh, to, to help ensure our submarine industrial base can be as, as strong as possible. So we will want to keep investing in it, um, and AUKUS is, of course, a piece of that. But more broadly, having that undersea advantage is critical. I understand that. I'm just trying to get a bottom line as to whether Pillar 1 will require additional allocations of our defense resources in our budget. I see Pillar 1 increasing our collaboration with Australia and the UK and really building on investments that we have made to date and will want to continue to do in the spirit of the National Defense Strategy's focus on pacing uh, to, the, to the need to deter uh, um, the People's Republic of China. So are you saying there will be no 
increase in the projected resources necessary, or do you believe that there will be additional stress on our defense budget? I do not see that there is additional stress on the defense budget due to AUKUS. I see at the strategic level, AUKUS actually being immensely helpful for what we are trying to achieve stri strategically in trying to ensure that we have deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. Okay, on well, pillar two, uh, Secretary Lewis, if I might, I think this discussion has been very helpful in trying to understand how we are going to share technology uh, and be able to advance uh, this, the, the, the next generations as they come along. We know there are many of other allies that are interested in Pillar 2, both in the Asia-Pacific region as well as our NATO partners that are interested in being engaged in Pillar 2. So what standards will the administration use in order to deal with the requests that we're going to be receiving from our other allies? Um, Senator, thank you for raising this issue because um, let, let me just start by saying that right now we're really focused on getting Australia and the UK over the line. Um, uh, and you can see the significant amount of work that's taking. So we haven't made plans at this point to bring others in. Well, as, as our chairman and ranking member mentioned, what's done here is going to be used by other allies to say, why aren't we getting comparable uh, uh, considerations? Absolutely. Um, if I may, would it be helpful for me to talk a little bit about sort of, of exactly what we're putting in place? Because I think for any kind of um, exemption that allows faster defense trade between, as the chairman pointed out, not just governments, but between companies um, to universities and other places, it's important to understand that. And what we're asking for here is we need to make sure that we know who's going to be receiving these items, I think for obvious reasons. You want to know who's the, the, per, the recipient. You want to know um, that this is not an item that is prohibited under one of our uh, nonproliferation regimes. Um, and then you want to make sure um, that once you have that information, that when it lands in the country, that they're going to have their own protections in place so that it doesn't get transferred to a bad actor. Um, and so those are the kinds of requirements. It's The technicalities are in the weeds, but that's what we're looking for across the board, is so that we have that shared community, we know where things are going, we have an understanding of making sure that some things will still need to move with a license um, and still need to be looked at more carefully, um, and that all countries participating have those same standards. Um, and so I do think that is a precedent we're setting moving forward. I think to address something that Senator Rich raised is we want to make sure, and just to talk about the transformational nature of this, what we're talking about is license-free movement of these defense articles. That means that if you are on the list of companies or entities that can receive it, you don't have to come ask permission to export a lethal weapon. You can receive it. Um, and that is why this is so important, um, to make sure that when that entity, whether it's a university or a company, receives it, that nothing is going to happen in the next step where we end up having it exported to um, a bad actor or someone who may want to exploit it. And I think those are the standards we need across the board. Thank you. Senator Ricketts. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We've talked a lot today about deterring the People's Republic of China. As the Chairman said, They've uh, got the largest Navy in the world. They are expanding their capabilities. And this is all part of Xi Jinping's plan to dominate the world by 2049. And in some areas, they're outpacing us with regard to their technological capabilities. But one area they cannot do that in is our allies. And that's why this AUKUS agreement is so important. And it's important that we get it right, that we get our ducks in a row to be able to meet the commitment. The Navy has a requirement to have 66 fast attack nuclear submarines to be able to defend this nation. And right now we're sitting at 49, and I think Dr. Carlin, you mentioned that uh, up to 40% are not available or were not available due to maintenance issues, and they've got it up to, now it's down to 33% are not available. 
and they're hoping to improve upon that. But by uh, 2030, we're going to be dropping down to 46 submarines. And so even adding the additional submarines through availability because of maintenance, you're still not going to have anywhere close to the 66 submarines. So we're producing, as I think the chairman was pointing out, somewhere about 1.2 submarines, Virginia-class submarines a year. We need to get up to 2.3, 2.5, maybe 3 to be able to do that. So we have to make sure how this is going to get done. And my understanding is that uh, some months ago that um, OSD CAPE and the Navy produced a detailed plan for how to meet the funding and funding requirements to how to meet the U.S. and AUKUS uh, requirements. Is that accurate? Has this plan, has this detailed study been done? Senator, there's been a lot of study of, uh, of what we can do to make sure that we are prioritizing uh, this undersea advantage. So CAPE has been done. CAPE is done. There, there have, has yeah. been a lot of studying on uh, what we can do to ensure that we are investing as much as possible. Uh, as but has the OSD CAPE study been done? Is that done? They, that they have been working on a study. So it's not finished yet, or is it finished? I, I don't think I should represent OSD CAPE. So uh, what I will say is that they have been looking very hard at this issue and studying it. And if it is helpful, uh, I would welcome uh, asking my colleagues from that office to Well, this is really kind of the crux of the problem, right? Because one of the things that Senator Wicker, myself, and others have asked is, OK, you know, Australia is obviously making a generational investment in their submarine industrial base and ours, and we ought to be doing the same. I agree with you that this is a huge competitive advantage for us. And so the question is, what is that number? What is that number that's going to take? I think Senator Cardin was asking the same question. You kind of dodged it then, too. You know, obviously, we, we're, we're grateful that the Australians want to invest $3 billion. What are we going to have to invest to be able to get to 66 submarines? Is that study been done? And if it has been, can it be supplied to Congress? If it's not, when's it going to be done? That's Sen what we're looking for. Thank you for raising this issue, Senator. You know, as you know, post-Cold War, we closed down a whole bunch of the submarine industrial base and consolidated, given this kind of post-Cold War peace dividend. There has been really important investment by this Congress, by the administration, to try to build it up and to make sure that we can put it in the right places and then see kind of what fruits will go grow from that in terms of workforce and talent management, in terms of supplies. So there's been a lot, a lot, a lot going in there, and it w is a priority. It will continue to be a priority going forward. Right, but we, okay, I think that, again, when we're talking about how we're going to make this happen, if we want this to be a success, we actually have to have these plans. It's not sufficient just to say we're working on it. And this is part of the concern that some of the folks have. We want to make sure this is a success. I think AUKUS is incredibly important. If we're going to make it a success, we have to know what we're going to be investing. And this is why, you know, is the administration going to ask for a supplemental to be able to do this. And I'll throw that open to any of the panelists. Is the administration going to have a separate model to start doing this investment? When the, and what would be the timing? And are we going to get a study? I mean, these are the questions that we'd like to know to be able to make sure this is going to be successful. Does anybody have an answer to that? Senator, we want to make sure that we are robustly sharing information on this topic because we know how important bipartisan congressional support has been in AUKUS and also in investing in our submarine industrial base. That's great. So share the information. That's what I'm saying. I, you, I keep hearing you say you want to share the information, but I'm not getting any informa information uh, here. So what's the information? Is, is there a study that says, yeah, this is what we're going to need to do to make Austin success? How much money is going to cost? I'm expecting it's probably not a, a small number. Uh, Senator, we uh, have been able to share a lot of information, particularly over the last uh, few months, about what we are doing both on AUKUS and the submarine industrial base. Uh, I'm aware of a, approximately 45 briefings or so uh, to members and to staffs uh, over the last seven or eight months. Um, and I would be delighted to take this back uh, and work with colleagues in the Office of the Secretary of Defense to share, share the information that you are requesting. OK, and, and is there going to be a supplemental from the administration requesting inf uh, more dollars to be able to invest in our submarine industrial base? Uh, I, I'm not able to speak to that at, at this time. I this defer to my colleagues as well. Anybody else know? No, nobody else knows. OK, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will say that uh, whether in public or in classified, if the, if, the, if, the, if the numbers somehow some classified consequence to it, I think the senator's question is well poised. And I think all of us would be interested in knowing that answer. If you would take that back to the department, we'd appreciate it. Senator Shaheen. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I guess I would like to follow up a little bit on Senator 
Ricketts um, questions and Senator Cardin's. Um, but first I want to go back. Um, Dr. Carlin, you talked about the maintenance um, piece of our um, industrial base capacity and obviously the shipyard infrastructure optimization plan is making a huge um, impact on that. I can speak from the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard's perspective that we have we are about to double our dry dock capacity and that's going to give us much more uh, ability to maintain nuclear subs and get them out um, in a, an expeditious way. But I guess, and, and I would agree that we have made substantial investments in our defense industrial base in a way that is contributing to our ability to produce the submarines we need. Um, I've talked to suppliers in New Hampshire who are benef beneficiaries of that investment, but it still um, seems clear to me that despite all of that investment, we don't yet have the capacity in that defense industrial base to build the subs that we need to to meet the AUKUS agreement. Is that an accurate assessment or do you see something different? Uh, Senator Sheen, I think I might take that uh, a little bit of a wider aperture on that, which is uh, we absolutely need to be able to produce and maintain more submarines for our strategic interests, for our ability to be able to deter in the Indo-Pacific and also globally. I think we would all agree with that. I, I don't think that was an answer to my question, though. I think my question was, based on what I know about our situation at present, we don't now have that capacity. Is that correct or not? The, the I, I want to make sure I understand which capacity you're talking about, because the way AUKUS is set up, we're not actually going to be assuming congressional support, obviously. We would not actually be selling submarines to Australia for at least a few years, and uh, right, in, in terms of delivery. And if we continue on the trajectory we're on with maintenance, we would have uh, approximately seven more submarines that are operationally available at that time. Uh, so I think when I would look at that operationally available picture, it is a whole lot more, more satisfying to be able to ensure both to be able to ensure the strategic intent uh, of AUKUS. So what you're saying is if we continue to invest at the rate we are investing, um, that by the time our commitment to provide those submarines comes due, we will have that capacity. At this stage, with the information we have, it does appear as though we are on that right trajectory in terms of the impacts of, of investments. I think this is an area one needs to monitor really closely. Uh, I'm delighted to hear your case studies of the impacts of investments to date, uh, but we, we're just all going to need, need to watch that closely. Um, I've heard from our industry partners that they face challenges realizing AUKUS-related defense technology transfers and exports, and um, not at the senior level, um, because we've certainly gotten those assurances, but more at the action officer and manager level. Um, can either of you speak to that and whether you're seeing that um, move as we hope? Absolutely. And um, first of all, we are in regular conversation with industry um, to, on, across the board um, on these kinds of issues. Let me talk a little bit about um, what's going to be different once the, assuming the legislation moves forward. Um, and I think this will help um, presumably some of the concerns that you're hearing. Um, when it comes to Australia and the UK, uh, companies who, again, we know where they're sending an item to and we know that it's not uh, prohibited under a, an inter international agreement, um, they will be able to move without actually coming to the State Department for a license. That is a very significant change. But the second piece, which I actually haven't talked about as much, which is actually I think the thing we hear more from countries about, is um, right now, if you have a US defense article, like a weapon, and you want to transfer it between one company to another among the three countries, you also have to get, um, in essence, you have to come for authorization to do that. And among and between the three countries, US defense items, again, within the caveats that I laid out, are going to be able to move. 
Um, when I sit down and talk with companies that I met with the US AmCham, for example, when I was just in Australia, when we talk through those issues, those tend to be the core of their concerns. Now, there are always you know, some specific things that we have to work through, but that's why what we're doing here is so significant. Um, and we are doing it, again, with Australia and the UK because they are some of our closest allies and because of um, a long history of working with them on defense trade. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Haggerty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I welcome our guest today. Um, first, I'd just like to say that our friends in Australia and Britain ought to know that AUKUS enjoys very strong bipartisan support here in Congress. In fact, I can't think of a single member of Congress, whether they be Republican or Democrat, that doesn't support AUKUS, and at least the objectives of AUKUS. Uh, I think the question before the President and Congress right now is how to implement AUKUS quickly, also effectively, for everybody that's concerned. As part of the first submarine pillar, the administration has put forward a plan for the United States to sell and transfer some three to five nuclear-powered attack submarines to Australia starting in the early 2030s. But the administration still hasn't put forward a credible long-term plan to ensure that our Navy can meet its requirement to have 66 attack subs in a reasonable time frame. And ladies and gentlemen, that's a problem. Today, the Navy has 49 attack submarines. That's roughly 25 percent short of its goal of 66 submarines. The pace of making, as I've read, maybe 1.2 submarines a year, by giving these submarines to Australia, that'll put us three to four years behind in our production process. And looking at the Navy's most optimistic projection, they don't see realizing this goal of 66 attack subs until the year 2049. That's before taking into account the submarines that we would send to Australia. I understand that there's talk about maintenance being some type of fix for this, maybe extending the life of the submarines that we do have in service, but we're only at 75 percent of our goal right now in terms of how many submarines that we have. This is a Band-Aid fix. We've got to look at our capacity. There's no real substitute, I think, for having a strong industrial base to build these submarines and to meet our deterrence goals. And I'll start with you, Assistant Secretary Carlin. Do you agree or disagree with anything? Do you agree with what I said, or do you disagree in any way? Senator, I really appreciate the points you made on the strategic importance of AUKUS, but also on the importance of our undersea capability. It is un, an unparalleled comparative advantage, and it is absolutely a priority. The national defense strategy un underscores this as well. And the points I'm making on maintenance are in no way to ignore, to be clear, the importance of production as well. Um, it's just that we are all working through Congress's really important support and through the administration's prioritization to build up an industrial base that, frankly, was not as strong as I think anyone would like it to be. Speaking to that, that, that cooperation uh, between the administration and Congress, I look forward that, to, to the President working with Congress to make the necessary hard choices and work through regular order to get this done. So we are prioritizing resources rather than coming to some sort of emergency situation. Uh, we need to do that in a way, we need to implement this in a way that AUKUS works to make both America first interest and our allies interest first as well when it comes to nuclear powered submarines. Next I'd like to turn to Pillar 2 though and that focuses, Pillar 2 focuses on trilateral cooperation on advanced capabilities here. Advanced capabilities includes undersea technologies, quantum technologies, artificial intelligence and autonomous systems, advanced cyber, hypersonic and counter hypersonic capabilities, electronic warfare, information sharing. All of these are absolutely critical. And I want to make an important suggestion to you, and I'd be encouraged to hear your thoughts on this. You all know that I served as ambassador to Japan. I, I got to see firsthand Japan's superior capabilities when it comes to artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Our allies in South Korea also have similar strengths. And so my question, and I'll just put this to both uh, Assistant Secretary Lewis and to Assistant Secretary Carlin, do you agree with me on the need to find ways to incorporate U.S. allies such as Japan and South Korea into the Pillar 2 activities down the line? Um, first of all, let me just thank you for your leadership on defense trade. We've had a lot of conversations, and I 100 percent agree with you on um, the, the bipartisan need and strength and consensus around these issues. To get to your question, I think 
um, in the first things first, we're really focused on getting this right for our UK and Australia. And I think then we can look at whether there may be other countries who want to need to bring capabilities for specific projects. In my conversations, I can assure you they want to. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I would echo what Assistant Secretary Lewis said. And, you know, once we get this right, we could look at discrete partners for discrete, discrete projects. Mm -hmm. I also want to thank you for your leadership on the U.S.-Japan alliance, which is flourishing uh, in just extraordinary ways. Well, thank you. And I just want to reiterate how important AUKUS is to our own national security interest. And I look forward to working with all of you and I'm looking forward to working with the interagency to make certain we keep advancing this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you uh, for your testimony today. And, and I do want to start by applauding uh, President Biden and the Biden administration for striking uh, the AUKUS agreement to begin with. I think it's a very important move uh, in achieving our, our goal of ensuring a free and open Indo-Pacific. And I agree with the Chairman's remarks uh, that we should uh, move forward expeditiously in implementing it. I think that uh, further delay uh, will undermine our credibility, uh, both in terms of the strategy, but also with partners uh, that we enter into agreements with. So I, I hope we can overcome uh, the current delay uh, on that front. Uh, I also um, support the idea of streamlining um, export control provisions with respect to these two allies. Uh, I also share the chairman's view that uh, that should be accompanied by applying the highest standards uh, with respect to protecting our technologies. Um, and it's going to be very important uh, that these two partners, uh, the UK and Australia, adopt very strong uh, export controls. Uh, as has been said, we need to make sure that ours are um, as strong as possible. I, the pilot issue uh, was raised here, and, and so we all need to be looking at ways we can do it but at the same time, uh, providing some flexibility when we're talking about uh, these kind of uh, partners. Um, I want to talk about a little other piece of the technology sharing um, and co-production piece. And, and Dr. Carlin, maybe this is for you, maybe it's for Assistant Secretary Lewis. Um, I, as I read this, it does envision uh, technology sharing and co-production. Is that correct? It does indeed look at that. And I'm looking at a series of potential uh, weapon systems that we may be uh, co-producing autonomous underwater vehicles, quantum technologies for positioning, navigation, and timing. Th those are the kind of things that this envisions. Is that right? Yes, that's absolutely correct. May I add one thing here? I think part of why we're talking about these advanced technologies, and Dr. Carlin may want to add more on this, is because we think this is a unique opportunity to leverage the different capabilities and strengths that different the three countries bring to this problem set. Right. Um, and so why, that's why we're talking about co-production, and that's why the defense trade needs to be smooth. Right. So before, I, so I'm, you don't need to convince me of, of, of that, but here's my question and my concern, and this is going to be important with respect to precedent. Uh, let's take a hypothetical co-production agreement of a autonomous underwater vehicle where the United States um, invests the lion's share in the co-production, 80 percent, whatever it may be. Would either Australia or the UK under that scenario have the ability to veto a decision by the United States to transfer that system to, say, our Ukrainian uh, friends fighting Russian aggression um, as we speak? Because I think it's very important that we don't give up our ability and authority to transfer a system where we've done the lion's share of the production uh, to other allies in need. So can you, can you talk to that, either of you? Um, let me make sure I get you the correct answer. Um, let me start by saying co-production and co-development agreements vary significantly. We do these with other countries without AUKUS, and so I need to be a little careful about not getting ahead of whatever may be written into these agreements. Um, but fundamentally, um, if a U.S. company um, would own a certain kind of technology, um, then we would still be able to control the export of that technology. Um, but again, I need to be careful to not get ahead of um, the way these agreements are written, because they all do tend to be slightly different. 
Right, I understand. And in fact, you know, my, my concerns are, are raised by some of the current co-production agreements um, and the fact that some other countries are limiting our ability today to transfer our own uh, systems mm. uh, to uh, the fighters in Ukraine. And so I think it's a sort of open the door to the larger question of when we enter into uh, co-development agreements mm -hmm. and co-production agreements, where the United States is the primary actor and primary financial backer. Um, in my view, we should not be giving up our sovereign right to transfer those weapon systems to other allies in need. So for example, today to the Ukrainians. So I'm gonna to wanna to pursue that uh, question with you going forward. May I add one more thing on this? Um, part of the reason we're doing this with Australia and the UK is because they are among our closest allies where we would not anticipate those kinds of issues. Um, but these uh, co-production agreements do vary um, and happy to follow up with you uh, on that. Thank you. Senator Coons. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. It is um, so encouraging to have us in a hearing uh, where the two of you are really pulling in the same direction and leading uh, the Senate uh, in a positive and an important direction for our country and to have such uh, strong and unified testimony across the three witnesses uh, today. This is a critical strategic moment for the United States. Um, as our president has repeatedly said, and many of us have agreed, uh, our global network of allies is our critical competitive security, economic development and political advantage. Uh, and nothing has strengthened and deepened uh, that partnership in the Indo-Pacific like the AUKUS announcement. So it is up to Congress now to deliver on the legal authorities, the framework, the funding that you need to fully take advantage of it and accelerate it. Um, I recently had dinner with the Australian ambassador to the United States, Kevin Rudd, a, a trenchant observer of Australian politics given his former service as prime minister and uh, his deep and intimate knowledge of uh, the challenge posed by the PRC. Um, and uh, joined Senator Murphy and a number of other uh, two Republican senators and many House members on a trip uh, to the United Kingdom where we had a series of meetings uh, about AUKUS. I'm very interested in pillar two and the questions uh, Senator Van Hollen just raised, but let me just briefly at the outset, if I could, um, um, Ms. Lewis, Secretary Lewis, um, are there, can you be specific, are there any legal authorities that are required from this Congress that you think haven't been precisely defined in the previous rounds of questioning back and forth with you? I mean, I think just uh, to make a point of clarification, I think as you know, there are four different pieces of legislation yep. that we are looking to move. One of them, uh, which is focused on pillar two, is focused on the export controls. I would say it is, um, and I'm gonna take that one to talk about, I think the reason we need that legislation is because of what you just laid out. The companies and the countries need surety about how these defense articles are gonna move and we need confidence that they're gonna move speedily and safely. Um, and so it is mission critical for us to have this legislation. Um, Dr. Carlin may wanna add more on the other two, but obviously the ship transfer legislation is also uh, mission critical for achieving pillar one. Happy to go into any more detail that would be helpful. Um, before I turn to Dr. Carlin, let me just add um, a simple observation I made in our conversation in the United Kingdom. Uh, any list of the top 10 research universities in the world typically includes two from the UK, Cambridge and Oxford, if not others. Uh, their prime minister and many uh, in leadership there are focusing on their particular capabilities in artificial intelligence, uh, quantum computing as well. As you've mentioned repeatedly, pillar two um, in many ways has the longer term greater significance in that it may align our three nations uh, more closely in terms of developing really challenging and important new technologies, autonomous underwater drones, for example. I would argue that our procurement system, our defense procurement system is ossified, sclerotic, antiquated, slow moving, pick your favorite uh, multi-syllable description, but I don't think there's anyone that says that our defense innovation and procurement and deployment system is moving at the speed of technology and moving at the same speed of our pacing throughout the PRC. Is it possible that through the Pillar 2 partnership with Australia or the United Kingdom, given that they are smaller militaries, that they may have different 
uh, legal constraints or operational constraints that we would find in them a research development and deployment partner able to move with more agility, particularly in emerging technology areas. Dr. Carlin. Yeah, thank you very much, Senator. I think that's quite conceivable. I mean, as, as you note, our, our, whether it's our procurement system or our export control system, this was all kind of de designed for a different world, mm -hmm. one where we, the United States, had uncontested military and techno uh, technological dominance, and the security environment has changed in a whole bunch of ways. We have, as you note, this unparalleled network of allies and partners. It's our center of gravity, and so just as our system is, go is able to learn and move in different ways, so to Australia and the UK, and I suspect you heard a lot on, on your trip, both of whom have really put AUKUS at the heart of what they are doing. I'm struck by how the Ukrainians have demonstrated a remarkable ability to take off-the-shelf civilian products and modify them, deploy them, and to take material from dozens of countries all over the world in a way that our system just is not capable of doing. It's my hope that both out of AUKUS and in particular Pillar 2 and out of the war in Ukraine, we are learning about how to innovate in defense procurement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to our witnesses. Um, Secretary Carlin, I want to start where you did and just to acknowledge the Marines who were killed in the Osprey accident in Australia. And I want to mention their names. Uh, Corporal Spencer Collar, 21 years old, from Arlington, Virginia. Captain Eleanor LeBeau, 29 years old, from Belleville, Illinois. And Major Tobin Lewis, 37 years old, from Jefferson, Colorado. Um, we, we have great partners in the Aussies, but we're, we're in a dangerous line of work. And when people fall in that line of work, uh, they ought to be recognized, particularly to hearing like this. And I appreciate the fact that you began your testimony with that. Um, AUKUS is a great example of how the U.S. can work hand in hand with allies to promote stability in the Indo-Pacific. And it's a good example of the way we do things globally. In Europe, we have NATO. We don't have a NATO equivalent in the, in the Indo-PACOM, but we do have these networks of allies. And I do want to applaud the Biden administration work with South Korea and Japan. That Camp David meeting, it, it probably wasn't as big a headline here at home because we have good relations with Japan and South Korea. But the work of the administration to forge closer relationships between those nations, the mill-to-mill -mill relationship has often been strong, but it's been limited by challenges at the political leadership level. That was a really important summit, and I just want to applaud the Biden administration on that. Um, from my vantage point on the Foreign Relations Committee and as chairman of the Sea Power Subcommittee of Armed Services, this AUKUS partnership is very exciting to me, and it's also exciting because the Virginia-class submarines are built in Virginia and Connecticut. I had the opportunity to take Ambassador Rudd to our shipyard uh, about a month ago to really dig into the, the tremendous assets we have, but also the challenges. Some of the questions that have been directed about the current pace of production and how we can build up that pace, not only to meet our own needs, but to meet uh, the needs, uh, the commitments that we've made in AUKUS. I, I want to follow up on a question that, that Senator Menendez put in. What if we didn't do Pillar 1? Mm. Pillar 2, I think everybody's excited about it, and, and everybody's supporting Pillar 1. I think we're asking important detail questions. But, but it, there, there's a little bit of a chicken or an egg with Pillar 1, because Australia is going to make a historic investment in the U.S. industrial base. But they're only willing to make that investment if they know that during the 2030s, we will be willing to deliver to them three to five Virginia-class subs. If they make that investment, it will help us increase our pace of production. If they don't make that investment, it will be harder to increase the pace of production. We would like to be good on our commitment, but we're sort of saying, but, but we'll only be good on our commitment if we're confident we can increase our pace of production. Well, we'll be able to do that with the Australian investment. Without the Australian investment, it will be harder. So each side has something we definitely want to do, and each side has resources that can help each other, but we kind of have to get the timing of this right. We, we, Australia is not going to make the investment unless they have surety that there's going to be a deliverable for them. It would imagine going to the parliament and saying, you know, let's invest billions in the U.S. submarine industrial base. The question is going to be, and what are the guarantees that the Virginia-class subs will be there? So we should, we should use this historic opportunity of the Australian investment 
to enhance our ability to meet the production goals that we're talking about. And obviously that's not just an Australian investment. We've, we have been investing in the submarine industrial base in the last few years and we have more to do. And the questions about how much more I think are, are fair questions. On your crawl, crawl, walk, run, if we were not to do the Virginia class transfers, the ultimate goal is that Australia, which currently has no nuclear at all, I mean, they, they, the only nuclear Australia has is medical isotopes. They don't even have civilian nuclear. If, if we don't have this interim step of the transfer of the Virginia class subs, the ultimate goal that Australia will build their own nuclear subs off a UK design but chock full of American technology, they're not, that, they would be significantly delayed in their ability to develop a domestic submarine manufacturing capability if there was not a timely delivery of this interim step. Because with the Virginia class subs, they're already training their officers here in the United States to operate nuclear subs. Um, the Virginia class sub transfer would happen after we had done significant training of their workforce. And then with the Virginia class subs, they're learning to operate nuclear subs and maintain nuclear subs, possibly to refuel nuclear subs. And all those skill sets are needed before they begin to be a, a world-class producer of their own nuclear subs in the 2040s and beyond. So the, the AUKUS framework, and I'm now just talking about pillar one, is train them, accept their investment so we can expand our industrial base, ramp up our production, deliver assets to Australia that they can use and then learn on so that they can develop their own capacity. And that capacity would be fantastic for the United States and for all of the nations in the Indo-Pacific who care about stability there. So I, I think the crawl, walk, run analogy, which I hadn't thought of until you said it, is a really important one. We want to get the Aussies to a place where they have their own production capacity. The only way we can do that in a timely way is through the first step of the Virginia class deliverables. Their investment in our industrial base together with our own investment is, is going to get us there and benefit both American security and security of Australia and regions of the nation. Have I stated that right, Secretary Carlin? Senator, you've stated a lot more beautifully than I ever could. Okay. Well, I don't know about that, but I'll yield back. A lot more beautifully. What a, what a, what a compliment that is. Uh, and when you took I, I meant it, it as a compliment, to be very clear. Well, <laughs> oh, I, I, I was echoing your compliment. Uh, I wasn't questioning it. Uh, when you took Ambassador Rudd uh, there, which, which uh, submarine did you see? I brought back a hat from the USS New Jersey and delivered, <laughs> it, to, <laughs> delivered it to bravo, my committee chair. Bravo, bravo. All right, uh, Senator Duckworth. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. Last month, I led a CODEL to the Philippines, Indonesia, and Thailand to examine the many significant opportunities that our nations have to collaborate together in the Indo-Pacific region. So this is sort of following up a little bit on what Senator Kane is talking about. Um, again, the White House touts AUKUS as a new security partnership that will promote a free and open Indo-Pacific that is secure and stable. And I agree, the positive impact of AUKUS extends beyond these three allied countries. And in fact, I received very, um, quite a few positive comments mm -hmm. in the three nations I visited, Indonesia, Thailand, and Philippines, to AUKUS and what we are doing. Um, for each of the witnesses, how does AUKUS and Pillar 2 in particular impact the Indo-Pacific region as a whole beyond the three nations, uh, Australia, the United States? Um, and how will our partner nations in Southeast Asia benefit from a stronger trilateral relationship and an enhanced Indo-Pacific presence from the United States, Australia, and the United Kingdom? Thank you, uh, Madam Senator. Uh, first of all, I wanted to express appreciation for your investment uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, it really does matter uh, that you've taken strong interest in uh, ASEAN countries, ASEAN centrality. What I'd like to say about uh, those countries and more uh, countries in Asia uh, where you have been is uh, we've taken a, we've invested a lot of time in diplomacy, in making sure that all uh, countries in Asia understand in a transparent way what we are trying to achieve there. We stated earlier that uh, AUKUS is a modernization of long-standing partnerships that will uh, recognize the changes in the security environment for the future. 
And when we talk to Southeast Asian countries, you mentioned three yourself, but there are more than that. Uh, when we talk to countries like the Singapore's of the world, Malaysia's, they also recognize these challenges and they believe that our transparency, our candor about the challenges we see ahead, um, that AUKUS will help uh, address that. We are not trying to challenge uh, ASEAN centrality. We, in fact, believe that AUKUS can be complementary. Uh, to uh, ASEAN centrality. So we look forward to more discussions in the future with our uh, allies and partners uh, in Asia uh, and around the world to make sure they understand the truth about AUKUS, to make sure that the disinformation coming from other parties uh, does not prevail uh, and that they have facts and that uh, when we uh, provide those facts, we believe that we will prevail uh, over them uh, in ensuring the uh, security of uh, the East Asia Pacific region uh, in the future. Thank you. Ms. Lewis? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to agree with Pete Asmoy. I think when we talk about AUKUS, um, it's not just about the alliance between and the strengthening of that alliance between Australia and the UK. It's really the question. We say it a lot, but we really need it when we talk about a stable, secure, free and open Indo-Pacific. When that's what this alliance is about. And fundamentally, I think as Pete Asmoy was talking about, um, we believe that benefits the countries you listed as well as others. And I think resilience is another word, a term that we have been talking about, meaning that um, we are investing in a way that countries will be able to feel more secure and more resilient um, facing, and I think that um, Dr. Carlin mentioned this earlier, a whole new set of challenges and threats that we need to be able to respond to um, collectively as well as individually. Thank you. Dr. Carlin. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Duckworth. And I really appreciate hearing uh, reflection, reflections on, on your trip. That, that's heartening. Um, you know, the, the vision that we have of a secure and stable Indo-Pacific, I think, is the a vision that is manifested by AUKUS, but also by so many of our, our allies and partners uh, around, around Asia as well. And to the extent you have more, more partners who are actively involved in ensuring that that security and that stability can be realized through collaboration and cooperation, I think it, it really becomes a, a better better situation for, for all. So this feels like a pretty positive and I think symbiotic effort. I, I, I agree with you. I, I think that the success of these regional mechanisms, um, whether it's AUKUS or the Quad, um, uh, can only help uh, our interests in, in the Indo-Pacific region in particular. Um, I, th I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Merkley. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I had a chance to to travel uh, to Vietnam and Indonesia uh, earlier this year, and um, there's a, a fair amount of um, of confusion, I will say, as we talk about the AUKUS, uh, the Quad, and then reinforces centrality, as as you put it, uh, Deputy Secretary May. Um, of uh, ASEAN. There are issues that are particularly important to countries like individual issues uh, for Vietnam and uh, Indonesia. They're, they're different, very, two very different nations. We had quite positive responses to AUKUS from the Philippines, Japan, Taiwan, but a little bit of like, what's this all about and how does it affect us? And I know that a lot of work's been done to try to assure, and the, the word transparency has come up a number of times, that's, that's important. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, there is a lot of appreciation for Senator Leahy's uh, programs of cooperation to heal the wounds from the Vietnam War, including uh, addressing the, the munitions that continue to e explode in the, in the docks and contamination from uh, Agent Orange. But as you assess it now, and I guess I would address this to both you, Secretary Lewis and Secretary Amoy, um, do you feel like we have really assuaged the concerns expressed by some of those other nations, or is there still a little bit of kind of uh, feeling left out skepticism, if you will, that requires further work? 
Well, thank you very much, Senator, for that question. Uh, it is important uh, that we have those uh, uh, candid conversations with not just the countries that you identified, uh, but with all partners, uh, allies uh, in Asia. It's natural that something so new, so novel, uh, would generate uh, questions. And so uh, what we have done is undertake a very expansive effort to make sure that countries in the region do understand what this is and what it isn't. Uh, there, is, uh, there are rivals out there. There are adversaries uh, out there. Um, who will try to paint AUKUS uh, in a different light, uh, suggesting perhaps that uh, the U.S. is a provocateur. In fact, it's just the opposite of that. We are recognizing the uh, changing security environment in the future, and we are taking steps with like-minded countries, with uh, allies, partners, to address that. And we will exercise, we will go to all efforts to uh, inform others in the region, to reassure them of our intentions, what this is really about. I am glad that our partners, uh, the, uh, our Australian and UK partners, have also undertaken these efforts to make sure that uh, regional uh, friends and, and, and others uh, are fully aware of our intentions and uh, what this is. And so uh, we are committed to this. It is not uh, to say that we our work is done and that we are satisfied. Uh, we will continue as uh, AUKUS evolves to inform uh, our friends and partners out there just to make sure that they do understand uh, what we are trying to achieve. Um, May, I, I would like to just add something um, in addition to the AUKUS question, but to bring up something that you raised, which is, Part of what's really important is that our investment in the region is much broader than AUKUS. And I think what you pointed out, uh, my bureau actually runs the demining and unexplored, unexploded ordinance programs. We are the largest supporters of those programs in the world. Um, in some countries, that is our largest assistance program. We consistently hear from countries about how important that work is. And obviously, um, Senator Leahy was a, a leader in this. Um, and his vision um, helped us achieve these goals. But I think it's important to remember that as significant as AUKUS is, we are doing a lot of different kinds of work, investing and working with countries on issues that are critically important to them. And in this case, helping save their populations um, from stepping on unexploded ordinance, but then also letting, um, once lands are cleared, then they can be used for other productive purposes. So. Um, just to support uh, what uh, Pete S. Moy said, but also um, really thank you for raising that program. Yeah, uh, thank you, and I'll continue to, to really advocate for those programs in the context of, of, of Vietnam. The, um, there's this, this sense in the conversations um, that, hey, we really appreciate the counterweight to an aggressive China, but we're also concerned about our relationship with China because they're a powerful nearby ally. I mean, we reference to countries like Vietnam and, and, and Indonesia. And so we have both an opportunity and a concern. And as you recognized, uh, Secretary Moy, uh, China in particular uh, uh, accuses uh, uh, AUKUS of being a kind of a imperialist uh, uh, assault to cold, a Cold War version of attack on, on China, if you will, and to do, discredit it. But uh, there's a, a certainly a, a desire among a number of countries to have uh, strengthened counterweight, and, and I think we are working effectively in nation after nation with different issues because each nation is so different. But um, uh, good work. I am. I am. Um, uh, I missed. You probably addressed this earlier. So, uh, but if you didn't address it, feel free to address it. Uh, the uh, that we do not yet have pillar one in the Defense Authorization uh, Act, and uh, how what level of concern you might have about that. 
Thank you, Senator. Uh, pillar one, as Senator Kane was just discussing, is critical to the success of AUKUS. And the way this um, broader effort of AUKUS has been designed um, is it really is a crawl, walk, run approach. And so it's important uh, that uh, con Congress is enthusiastic of and supportive of the key pieces of legislation for pillar one, like the ship transfer legislation, like the training legislation, and like the legislation that would allow us to accept this historic and unprecedented and an investment by Australia into our submarine invest, uh, industrial base. That can ensure that all of the right things can happen so that Australia will be able to then uh, responsibly operate uh, conventionally armed nuclear power submarines as soon as possible. And of course, the strategic picture is critical as well. Uh, as, as you no doubt heard from your, your travels, uh, all eyes are on AUKUS. Um, it is a spectacular effort and showing that together these three allies can deliver deterrence in every phase and help ensure that the Indo-Pacific remains secure and stable today and in the future is crucial. And what, what state are those uh, submarines being made in? Uh, I, I, I believe they're being made in a, a couple, there, there are actually uh, parts, I believe, from a variety of, of states. I think the word Virginia is the word you were searching for <laughs> there. Thank you all very much. Thank you. You just made it in time, Senator Young. Um, I'll give Senator Young a moment to, to uh, uh, get ready for his questions. As I do, let me ask you one last question. This committee has demonstrated a willingness to provide legislative relief where required to facilitate defense exports under AUKUS. However, there's far more that will need to be done by the administration at both state and DOD to make this a reality. Uh, as has been said here, the U.S. arms export system is convoluted and technical. The system's not built to move quickly, yet solutions to many of these challenges do not require legislative relief. I know the administration has developed an AUKUS authorization framework utilizing existing authorities, but this challenge goes beyond AUKUS to Ukraine, to Taiwan, and across the globe. So I want to ask both Dr. Carlin and Secretary uh, Lewis, can you update the members of the committee on efforts underway at state and DOD to improve the efficacy of arms exports? Senator, um, you're absolutely correct. Um, and we have taken a number of steps to improve um, our system. Let me take just a minute and talk about the foreign military sales system. Um, we've been very focused in this hearing on uh, the commercial to commercial or commercial to government side. Um, and we've undertaken a plan which we call uh, FMS 2023, um, the goal of which is to streamline how we move cases forward um, when we're selling between governments. On the good news front, um, at w where we stand now, we move 90% of cases within 24 to 48 hours, but it's the 5 or 10% of cases that we need to look at how do we make changes. I'm not going to go through every detail, but just to give you a sense of what we're doing. We're, a we're asking questions, and I, met, I meet with my team every two weeks. I met with them yesterday. How could we do a better job at prioritizing? That does mean deprioritizing, but how can we make sure we're prioritizing countries based on our national security strategy, the defense strategy? Two, how can we better train the people who have to execute these programs? Um, that sounds like a simple problem. It's actually quite significant. Um, we're obviously looking at improving and continuing to improve our work with Congress, which, where you play a critical role um, as we uh, come with uh, congressional notifications. And then we have a whole host of other pieces that we're working on, including some things that I think are very important in terms of looking at questions of exportability from the beginning of the process. Often what we find with these complicated systems is they're designed for our um, military, which they should be, for our own warfighter, but they need to be adapted or changed as we look to export them. We need to make the decision making about that much earlier in the process so we're not slowing it down at the end. Um, much more there, but I want to give Dr. Carlin a chance as well. Thank you. I might just add three points uh, of kind of uh, reforms that we've been trying to make to, to our, our part of it. So one is we're working on pulling together a security cooperation common operating picture. And that is because it's, uh, it, you know, 
looking, being able for folks to be able to see from initiation until delivery, looking across uh, that entire bucket of what's happening, seeing what's where, what needs to move. That's been a really important step that we've been working on for transparency and for communication. Another piece I want to highlight is these process improvements. And some of that is, I think, in line with what Assistant Secretary Lewis was saying, is making sure that not only can folks see the entire picture, but then they can elevate the challenges, right? And be able to figure out, hey, we, we need to deal um, with, with an accountability problem here. Something's not moving here. The third piece I want to highlight is uh, Secretary Austin announced uh, over the last few months the creation of the Defense Security Cooperation Service, which gets at this crucial issue of training. So much of this starts uh, with uh, the folks um, in the U.S. military who are working in the countries, in our in our embassies, with our partners and allies, and allies, and trying to understand what is it they're looking for, why are they looking for how that, how does it fit within our national security interests. So we're standing up a really robust training effort so that we can ensure we are organizing and training the folks um, appropriately to be able to make this all as successful as possible. Obviously, all this is hand in glove with our colleagues at the State yeah. Department. I just make a comment. The, you know, the, is, I know there are people at State particularly, but maybe Defense too, who rally against the uh, informal process. I have to be honest with you. Uh, when my staff gives me the, um, the, the sale notice, I generally do it in the same day. It depends. It's very rare when uh, the, the end user who we're tentatively going to sell to has problems. And I am concerned about those problems because um, I have no ideological problems in selling American weapons abroad. I am have a problem when the end user is going to use it wrongly. Uh, against civilians uh, and other entities. So, um, so for our part, I know as, as the chair, I've been, tried to expedite our response uh, so it can be quick. Uh, but I think it would be a huge mistake uh, if anybody tried to undo the, formal, uh, the informal process. Senator Young. Thank you, Chairman. I, I thank our witnesses for being here today. I know it's been kind of a long morning for you. As a committee, uh, we need to recognize that Pillar 2 of AUKUS will be impossible to achieve without a secure supply of critical minerals. China's dominant position in this sector, particularly through its deep ties to a number of developing resource-rich nations, has led, to it, led it to account for approximately 60% of worldwide production and 85% of global product, critical mineral processing. Fortunately, Australia is well positioned to help us reduce this dependency, uh, especially for critical defense r requirements, uh, including cobalt, tungsten, manganese, and, and lithium. And I believe we need to ensure that AUKUS takes Australia's existing and potential role as a mineral supplier into consideration. This should start with the strategic decision to designate Australia as a domestic source under the Defense Production Act, as was included in the Senate passed NDAA. And if time permits, I'll, I'll ask Dr. Carlin how the goals of AUKUS would be advanced by extending certain authorities under the Defense Production Act, such as the designation of domestic source to other trading partners with critical minerals that found, aren't found in the U.S. Uh, but in my time, uh, I certainly want to get to uh, Secretary Lewis and uh, start by asking what existing regulatory or statutory barriers might be hindering our foreign procurement of critical minerals, and how would this impact the goals of AUKUS? Of course, defer to other witnesses if, if, if you like on this question. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, I'm not uh, an expert on um, critical minerals, uh, but what I can say is that we uh, do have discussions with a number of countries um, about the availability uh, of, of uh, these uh, critical minerals or rare earths. And so uh, we do know that this, uh, there are uh, supply chain issues. We do know that it is uh, of critical importance to get off uh, reliance on specific countries that may have uh, cornered the market or may have dominance in, in these areas. So um, those countries, in, including Australia, but it could be Indonesia, it could be any number of countries in, in Africa, uh, in other places in the world uh, where, there are, where there is availability, uh, we are absolutely talking with uh, governments uh, to uh, discover uh, ways to uh, 
uh, stay off that kind of dependence on, on a single country or other countries. Thank you very much for, for raising this, the Senator. Uh, on uh, DPA uh, and, and uh, Australia in particular, I would just highlight that adding the UK and Australia as domestic sources would streamline technological and industrial-based collaboration. It would accelerate and strengthen AUKUS implementation, and it would build new opportunities for co-investment in the production and the purchase of critical minerals, exactly as you note, and also critical technologies and other strategic sectors. Uh, I would see this as perhaps a complementary effort to the export control reform that uh, conversation that is also happening, um, but probably not a substitute uh, for that conversation. Okay, thanks. I, you know, as much as anything else, I'm, I'm, I'm I, I, I keep bringing this issue up in the hopes that. Um, these critical mineral conversations are happening happening um, among almost all the stakeholders within our government, with their counterparties and in, in, in foreign governments as, as, as well. Because I believe, and, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, that this is a real risk factor in implementing many of our priorities, including AUKUS. And if it's not regarded as, as, as a risk factor, then um, I, I'm concerned uh, because I think one of the risks is this is so little discussed compared to other issues, and and uh, so um, hopefully the administration will will engage this committee on on uh, critical minerals, maybe in other contexts. Given the essential role of critical minerals in our advanced weapons systems, would ITAR? apply to critical minerals from Australia? Based on my understanding, I don't think that ITAR would apply to critical minerals. Uh, we, uh, the ITAR comes on, uh, applies to items on the U.S. munitions list, um, which fall into, generally speaking, uh, weapons or things associated uh, directly with weapons. Thank you. Given the importance, lastly, of, of critical minerals to AUKUS and indeed our economic prosperity, how should the United States be considering supply of minerals in response to the recent BRICS summit and its emphasis on critical minerals? No, absolutely, uh, Senator. Um, that is something that uh, at the, at the high le highest levels of the State Department, we have had uh, discussions with a number of countries, uh, including the ones I just mentioned. If you, you know, I could just cite a few examples: Philippines and nickel, uh, Indonesia. We talk about cobalt in, in Congo and in, in other countries as well. So it is a, pr a priority. Uh, this is a, of great importance, and maybe not known as well to the American public, but it is something that uh, we are definitely seized with when we see uh, that there are opportunities again uh, to um, to take action uh, where in the past we may have been over reliant on specific countries that so have just as a follow-up are, are are there particular minerals uh, that uh, our government deems us disproportionately reliant on a BRICS or a BRICS, BRICS plus as we think about expansion country or countries that need to concern us, whatever the risk threshold might be for a particular mineral. I'll leave it to the government to establish those. Have we, have we identified a, a mineral that could be cartelized in a BRICS plus construct and we need to come up with alternative sourcing or processing capacity in order to address that vulnerability. No, that's right. You, you actually put your, uh, your finger on um, uh, one of the main issues here, and that is the processing part of this as well. As we know that many countries have these critical minerals, but the experts on the processing it's in another country, right? And we all know uh, what that country is. And so um, I think it is our priority to, uh, whenever possible, find uh, or develop alternatives um, to what we've seen. Again, uh, an over-alliance on one country has put us in a, a vulnerable position, has put the world in a vulnerable position, and that's what we have to address. Thank you. So is there a plan you can point to to address this, this larger issue? For example, processing. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm 
personally not overseeing that uh, area, but you know, I can actually uh, ask uh, colleagues uh, who uh, do have uh, an expertise on this area to consult with your, your team, uh, members of this committee. Uh, Thank you. That's Thank you, Chair. Of interest. Uh, Senator Kane has one final question. Um, Secretary Moy, this is uh, a little bit beyond AUKUS, but we've talked a lot today about the value of alliances. Talk a little bit about the um, the, the value of this Camp David summit that President Biden pulled together with Korea and Japan. I've been waiting for something like this for the entire 10 years that I've been in the Senate. And I was overjoyed to see it happen. Talk a little bit about going forward, how this will help regional stability. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Senator, for, for raising that because uh, we who have followed these issues uh, in East Asia have been waiting for a moment like this uh, for a generation, really. It, uh, the fact that this was the first time foreign leaders were invited to Camp David uh, since, I think it was 2015 was the last time, tells you about the significance of this. And to bring together these partners, we know that there are uh, historical uh, painful, uh, there's historical painful history here. But we have to applaud the courage of uh, the ROK President Yoon as well as Prime Minister Kishida in um, you know, taking up this challenge because they recognize that the, the geostrategic conditions in East Asia have changed. And we have to recognize that we have to respond to this. And the best way for this is to unite or to bring together these two democracies that have so much in common with us in terms of values, bring them together in an effort to push back on some of what we've seen out there. And so when we talk about the the regional uh, security environment changing, we're not talking about just one country. We, we could be talking about uh, Russia's illegal and unprovoked uh, attack on a sovereign nation. North we can Korea. talk about since 2022, the nearly 100 launches of missiles coming from the DPRK, including four ICBMs just this year. And so this environment has created this opportunity for us to unite a country like-minded countries uh, in, to protect our security include, and this is important, that it is about American security as well as the entire East Asia Pacific region. Absolutely significant and we look forward to more conversations. It's not easy. Uh, it's not exactly the most popular thing. It's not going to win a lot of votes in, in each of these countries because of that shared uh, painful history. Um, but we think it is the first step in a, in a significant um, uh, change uh, to the future of um, the, the security environment right. in the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you. Godspeed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, well, this has been a very helpful, uh, robust hearing. With that, the record for this hearing will remain open until the close of business on Friday, September 8th. Uh, we'd ask the panelists, if they receive questions, to please respond to it uh, and respond to it uh, in a substantive way. With the thanks of the committee for your participation and your insights, this hearing is adjourned.